Sorry for the uh, delay there. It's one of those mornings. Printer was out of ink, and we had to scramble. Thank you, uh, Kara and Tim, for providing your laptop. I've never preached from a laptop before, and so we'll see how it goes. It's better than my phone. That's what I was prepared to do with uh, small font and small screen. Uh, so this should at least be a bit easier. But um, anyway, if you would turn with me, turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and we want to read uh, from verse 8. Uh, my family had some providential things happen to us towards the end of this week, which took me out of my study. Uh, but that's actually not uh, the reason that I wanted to preach from Exodus 20. I had decided earlier in the week uh, to preach on something that I've preached before, and I think it's good for us to revisit the Sabbath command. And uh, part of my wanting to preach on it is because of the cultural moment in which we find ourselves in light of COVID, in light of churches going virtual, in light of many Christians neglecting the gathering of the church, and in particular, even as recent as of this week, how many conversations I have had with professing Christians who say that they have not been to church in a year and a half, um, that they've just not got back into the rhythm of regular worship with God's people. And it's made me want to revisit this topic our duty to delight in God on God's day. So let's read together from Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. Let us pray and seek God's help this morning as we come to the preaching of His Word. Father, we pray that you'd be our help this morning as we come to your word. All scripture is inspired by God, breathed out your very word to your people, profitable to us for our instruction and our correction, for our training in righteousness. Lord, we ask that you would bless us as we consider the the blessing that is ours in the Lord's day. Lord, we thank you for the Lord's day. We thank you for today that you have once again awoken us by your grace, that you've gathered us as a church to come together, to sit around your word, to sing to one another, to enjoy the fellowship of the saints, Lord, to give ourselves to the means of grace, to worship you, to encourage one another. Lord, we pray that you would help us as your people to be thankful for the Lord's day, that we would view it as a market day for our souls, Lord, cause us to trade and to do business in spiritual things. Cause us to look to our brother and our sister and their spiritual needs as we seek to build them up. Father, we pray that you'd be our help. Give us uh, attentive minds, attentive hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored. Help us, Lord, to more honor the day that you have set apart for uh, the peculiar task of corporate worship. We pray, Lord, that you'd be our help. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Time is one of our most precious commodities that God has given us. Uh, It it really is. We are not, all of us know as we get older, we are not given an infinite amount of time. And once we spend our time on something or on someone, we cannot get that time back. And therefore, What we spend our time on and who gets our time shows who and what we really genuinely value and love, right? We we understand this from just a, a human analogy. The husband who chooses to work late on the wedding anniversary or chooses to go out with friends instead of spend time with his wife is saying something to his wife. Uh, Children who are neglected by parents who make no time to play with them, to read with them, uh, to spend time with them, they are, that those kids are getting a clear message from mom and dad. 
And that message is this, that I have priorities in life, but you are not one of them. And tragically, as I've already mentioned in my introductory comments, many professing Christians treat God in exactly the same way by disregarding his day and spending it on their own pleasures. We need to reframe how we think, not only about the fourth commandment, but about all of the commands of God. We too often view the commands of God the way that the devil sought to trick our first parents into viewing the commands of God in the garden. You remember what the devil tried to get Adam and Eve to think. He convinced them that God was withholding from them something good, that he was restricting them with his, with his commands. Uh, the devil was, as it were, making an attack on the very heart of God, turning God, at least trying to turn their view of God, as, into seeing him as some sort of killjoy tyrant and turning his commands into straitjackets that bind us. Brothers and sisters, you know if you're a Christian, God's commands are not burdens meant to restrict our joy. His commands are like fences that are put all around us in order to keep us wandering sheep within the pastures where joy is found. And it's no different with the fourth commandment. In the fourth commandment, God is essentially like a husband who every week says to his bride, one day this week we are setting apart for just you and I. God is like the husband who says to his wife, clear the calendar. Put all other things aside. What wife in her right mind would say, do we have to do this every week? <laughs> I mean, we have to have another candlelit dinner? But that's often how we view God's day and His command that we honor His day. The Sabbath is God's invitation for us to come and enjoy the bounties of His table, to enjoy corporate worship, the fellowship of the saints, works of mercy, for us to come again once in every seven days to rest in God's goodness toward us and to reciprocate and express our thanks and worship to Him. Now, what I want to do is, in terms of structure, I have three, three sections this morning, okay? Um, what I want to do, first of all, is lay out a case. It's not an exhaustive case, but at least a beginning, the beginnings of a case, arguing for the abiding validity of the Sabbath for us as Christians. The second thing I want us to do, turning more practical, is consider the meaning of the command, and then thirdly, draw application together. So first of all, I want to lay out for you at least what appears to me to be a biblical case for the abiding validity of the Sabbath. And in one sense, I thought about just scrapping this whole first section because we're already members of a Reformed Baptist church. Our confession already explicitly affirms the abiding validity of the fourth commandment. Um, but as I say, because we live in a context in which it is so often denied, and even by those whom, who don't actually, actually deny it, in practice, it is neglected by so many. And so I want to begin here, and I want to offer you three reasons for why we should see the Sabbath command as still in force for Christians. Three arguments. The first one is this. The Sabbath is rooted in creation. Okay, the Sabbath is rooted in creation. In other words, we just read from Exodus 20, right? Which is what? What, what covenant is God beginning there? Anyone? The Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant. What I am saying, and what Moses explicitly shows here, we'll consider it, is that while the Sabbath command is explicitly given in the context of the Old Covenant, given to Israel, that doesn't mean it came into existence in the Old Covenant. Um, now, many, and, and even men who are, many of them are my heroes, these are men that I love and respect, there are many who argue that the Sabbath was uniquely given to Israel, and when the New Covenant came, the Sabbath was abolished along with the rest of the Old Covenant. Now, I wonder, how would you respond to that argument? Um, this is tricky. Follow with me here. This is a bit tricky because we do affirm that God has at times uh, instated certain laws which govern one covenant, which he then freely abrogates in another covenant, right? 
Um, Just because God makes something a law at one time for some people does not necessarily mean it is a law for all people at all times. And so, for instance, our confession in chapter 19 on the law of God says that when the new covenant came, both the ceremonial and the judicial laws given to Israel have expired with that nation. Right? So we affirm there are many things uniquely given to Israel that when that nation expired, these also expired with it. These are what we call, I'm going to give you some terms this morning. You've heard them before, but hopefully the more often I mention them, the more they'll kind of stick in your brain. These are what we call positive laws, okay? Now, when we say positive, we mean these are laws that rest upon nothing else but God's good pleasure to impose them, okay? Now, contrast that with another type of law, which we call the moral law. The moral law is not merely rooted in God's good pleasure, but it is necessarily rooted in the very character of God himself. Right? So let me explain the difference between those two. There is nothing, inherently in, nothing inherent in God's nature that makes it inherently sinful to eat pig. Right? I hope we would all agree with that. How do we, how do we know that? Well, we know that because we are now allowed to what? To eat pig. If there was something inherently in God's nature that prohibited that, God would not be able to ag- um, abrogate that command. Um, But God did determine for a time that it would be forbidden. That's a positive law. But contrast that with a moral law, like the command to not bear false witness. Uh, The command that we not lie is always in force because it is moral, meaning it is rooted in God's very nature as the God of truth. And because God does not change, God always requires that we be truthful and not speak falsehood. So the question comes, well, which type of law is the Sabbath? Is it positive? Is it moral? And you might be surprised to hear me say that actually um, the Sabbath contains an element of both positive law and moral law. Now that should confuse you. (laughs) I I did that on purpose. How can something be moral and and positive? Well, let let me explain it. Um, In terms of the specific day that the Sabbath is to be observed upon, That's a positive aspect, right? Because it used to be on Saturday, and God then changes it to Sunday when Jesus rises from the dead. So that aspect of which day, there's a positive element to it. However, the principle of us setting apart one day out of seven for rest and for the worship of God is a morally binding principle upon all men, not rooted merely in the Mosaic Covenant, but in creation. And that's what makes it morally binding upon us. Right? This is what Moses is getting at. Who is, who is the first one who rests from his work in Genesis? God. Right? God is the one who rests. He's the pattern. And that's what we see here in verse 11. This is what God appeals to as the basis of our obligation to keep this command. He says, for in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So I conclude, it seems Moses' argument is that this is morally binding because it is rooted in God's very pattern at creation. Now, second argument, these second two are briefer. Jesus affirms the Sabbath. Okay, so that's something about creation and Moral law versus positive law. That's the most most technical, so you can breathe easy. These these next ones are simpler. But the second one, what about our Lord Jesus? Jesus affirms the Sabbath. Um, You're probably aware that most of the, or many, I guess I should say, of the fights and arguments that happened between Jesus and the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they happened, they were the result of what Jesus was doing on the Sabbath, Right? Um, In their view, Jesus was a Sabbath breaker. Now, let me ask you this. When you read your Bible, particularly the Sermon on the Mount is what I'm thinking of here. When you read Jesus say things again and again, like, you have heard it said, but I say to you, who is Jesus correcting there? Is Jesus correcting the Old Testament law? Or is he correcting the false, wrong interpretations that the Pharisees had put on top 
of the law. He's correcting the Pharisees, right? He's saying, you've heard it said from these guys, your teachers, but I say to you. He's, he, in fact, he's restoring the law. Well, the same thing is happening when we see him restoring the Sabbath. Uh, J.C. Ryle, had, uh, he quipped. He said, he said, saying Jesus came to abolish the Sabbath is like saying a man destroys his house when he cleans the moss off the roof. I, I think that's a good analogy. Um, Jesus was cleaning off the moss put there by the Pharisees. He's not destroying the house. He's not destroying the Old Testament. Um, let me give you a couple examples. And if you're fast, you can turn there. Otherwise, you can just look it up later. Mark chapter 2. You remember, Jesus approves of his hungry disciples picking the heads of grain on the Sabbath because they were hungry. All right? So they're walking. It's the Sabbath. They're hungry. Walking through fields of grain. They're picking it and eating it. What do the Pharisees do? The Pharisees get all riled up. You can't do that because that's work, right? That requires exert, exerting energy, and that can't be done on the Sabbath. Well, what's Jesus' reply? He doesn't say, no, no, no. You don't understand the Sabbath is no longer in effect, but rather Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus is operating, as the Old Testament did, under the idea that the Sabbath exists to serve man for his joy, for his benefit. It wasn't given to enslave men, right? And in this instance, for instance, to starvation. Or Mark chapter 3, the very next chapter, uh, Jesus heals the, man with a shriveled uh, heals the man with a shriveled hand, telling us that it is lawful to do good on the Lord's day, not evil. Now, just at this point, I'm going to say more about this in a, in a, in a coming point, but let, let me just pause and make a comment um, at, at this point. Jesus heals. Jesus does good on the Sabbath. I think many Christians wrongfully view the Sabbath more through the eyes of the Pharisees than they do through the eyes of Christ. The Pharisees basically understood... Um, they basically understood keeping the Sabbath as the cessation of exerting energy, right? Um, basically, you would be, uh, you, th that's why you couldn't carry your mat on the, on the Lord or on the Sabbath. That's why you couldn't uh, walk more than a certain distance, etc. They basically equated doing nothing with keeping the Sabbath, right? Whoever can do the least is the most holy. Jesus overturns that. Um, Jesus demonstrates that the point of the Sabbath is not zero exertion of energy. And we know that when simply by thinking about Jesus' Sabbaths. They're very busy, full of ministry. But rather, the point of the Sabbath is the refocusing of that energy, which six other days out of the week are focused on my physical needs and things like that. And we are, we are um, refocusing those energies towards God and towards doing good to others. Now... I know, before I move on to my third argument, just briefly, I know someone will say, yes, but Jesus was a Jew who lived under the Old Covenant. And so, of course, he upholds the Sabbath, but it was soon going to be abolished. To that, I would simply say this. It's true in the New Testament, we see plenty of things Jesus says are going to be abolished. Uh, we see him declaring all foods clean. We see him talking about how the Jew-Gentile division is going to be nothing, or come to nothing. We see him talking about how the temple will soon be irrelevant to the worship of God. Jerusalem will be irrelevant to the worship of God. But we never see Jesus saying that he is going to abolish the principle of one day being given to, to God in the worship of God. In fact, we see Jesus declaring himself to be Lord of the Sabbath. So, third example, briefly, and then we'll move into more practical considering the Sabbath. The third uh, argument is the early church example from, from the New Testament itself. Um, the early church began immediately not to ignore the Sabbath, or what we call the Lord's Day, but rather they began to see it transformed by the resurrection of Christ, and they begin observing the Lord's Day on not on the Saturday, the last day of the week, but on Sunday, the first day of the week. And, and that makes sense. The original creation, the Sabbath was on the last day of the week. Right? Adam was, as it were, working towards his rest. 
But the new creation is marked by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And we now celebrate on the first day of the week, we are working from our rest. Right? Christ, um, he dies on Good Friday. He rests in the tomb on the old Sabbath. Right? The old creation is dying with him, as it were. And he brings with him out of the tomb on Sunday the new creation. Uh, the new creation is birthed in the resurrection of Christ. And that's why the church began to celebrate and to gather together on the first day of the week. Let, let me just give you a couple, a few texts here. Acts 20, verse 7 says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together. Or 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 2. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. Um, the Apostle John, this is one of the most significant ones in my opinion, in Revelation 1.10, the Apostle John says that he received his, re the, the revelation, that he received it, quote, on the Lord's day. Now that's a very peculiar way of speaking if John didn't believe that there, any, that there was any such thing as a unique day given to the Lord anymore. But he calls it the, the Lord's day. Uh, you know Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves, as is the habit of some. In other words, the early church doesn't do away with the principle of the Sabbath. They saw it transformed, but not abolished. Now, there's much more that could be said. Those are three reasons that I think the fourth commandment is still binding upon us. It's still something that we are obligated to do. Um, but leaving that aside, you can study that more. We can talk further let, let's turn more practical now at this point. Um, and this, this really is the main, the main focus of what I want to encourage us in. Let's consider the meaning of the command and then some application uh, from the command. This command co contains two, two commands and one prohibition. Two things that we must do to keep the fourth commandment and one prohibition of what we cannot do. The first command, positive command, is remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. I find it ironic that the only commandment that we are commanded to remember is the one that it seems is easiest for us to forget. Remembering here is not, not just a cognitive kind of you know, exercise, but to remember means to keep it in mind and to order one's life accordingly. Uh, we are to keep the Sabbath in mind as an important obligation, as a commitment uh, that is just built into our lives. Um, I'll, I'll give you another human analogy from my own life. I unfortunately am guilty of this. I almost was guilty of it this week. Um, I, on occasion, will verbally commit to something with someone, like a meeting or a phone call or whatever, but I don't put it on my calendar. I don't, you know set a reminder or anything on my phone to go off. And before I know it, very quickly, my schedule begins to fill up uh, with other things because I'm not remembering it. And suddenly, I find that I've so crowded my schedule that I can no longer keep my original uh, appointment. Um, that, that's the point of remembering the Sabbath. Uh, it's the same, same thing with the Lord's Day. And I've just hit some button that's totally moved me in a different part of my manuscript. Give me two seconds. Here we go. That might happen again. I'm, uh, to be, uh, Kara, it's a wonderful laptop, but to be honest, I'm not liking preaching from a laptop so far. <laughs> and I'm sure you can tell that I'm struggling. Um, it shouldn't shock us as Christians to hear that we ought to guard the Lord's Day even more carefully than we guard all of the other commitments that we have in life. Um, you think about it. Genuine hearts that have been genuinely converted by God's grace, that genuinely have received love from God and that love God, those kinds of hearts don't forget God's day. Love leads us to want to spend time with God on the Lord's day. And what this means is that we ought to view the Lord's day as, you think of the solar system, the sun is at the center we should view the Lord's Day as the sun of our week, and the rest of our lives are just orbiting around the sun. It, it is the central thing. Uh, it's not the last thought, it's the first thought. It, it is the great priority which governs the ordering of all of our other affairs. Um, similar to like if you plan you know, a birthday party for your, for your children. 
you don't just casually kind of say we're going to have a birthday party and don't do anything and you just hope that everything magically comes together on the, the day. You get everything in order. You get all your fares done. You get things ordered. You get food ready so that when the event comes, you can give yourself to enjoying the day itself. Um, that, that's what this aspect of remembering is getting at. We are to guard the Lord's Day. Um, the second positive command is that this day is to, be, uh, is to be kept holy. So we are not only to remember the, the, the Sabbath, but to keep it holy. That means set apart, unique. Uh, simply put, what that means is that the, the Lord's Day, excuse me, the Lord's Day is to be spent and regarded differently than the other six days of the week. Right? If the Lord's Day is holy, that means it's different from the other six days. Now let me say this, and I've said this before. There's a reason God chooses to call it the Lord's Day and not the Lord's Hour. It's not, it's not the Lord's few hours for church attendance. It is His day. God stakes claim on the whole thing. And, and I know in a day of you know, casual Christianity in which God is kind of viewed as the optional icing on the cake, to actually say that is to make me, in some people's minds, liable to being called names. <laughs> like legalist, right? I mean, how, how dare you say that I actually should give a whole day up to God? Now, if that's you this morning, and if that's kind of your gut response to this idea that God actually stakes claim on one day out of my week, I, really, I want to lovingly tell you that reveals something about the way you view God. Because doesn't a child love a day where his, with his father and, and, and just wishes that everything, wishes, uh, excuse me, wishes with everything that's in him that this day can just go on and on and on? Right? I think of when, when I take vacation, um, Jerusha and Jude, from the very beginning of the vacation, they'll start counting how many days we have left, right? D Dad, you mean we still have seven days till you go back to work? Uh, you mean we still have four days? We still have two days before, before you go back to work? That should be the heart of God's people towards the Lord's Day. Not how little time do I have to spend with God in order to, you know, fulfill the command, but how much time do we have that still remains to be with Him? And to be with his people. Um, it's true. If you're here and you're an unbeliever, without genuine love for God, without being redeemed by his grace, this will seem to you like a burdensome commandment. And the Lord's Day will seem to you like a day of drudgery. But for the godly, it's the broad road of liberty and joy. Uh, you think of it. How gracious of it. I don't, we don't think about the Sabbath in these terms. We should. How gracious and good of God is it that he actually commands me to put aside all the other things that preoccupy me in life, all the anxieties and stresses of employment and all these things. He commands me, put them aside so that you can rest and enjoy me and enjoy my people. We are so strange that we have the amazing ability to the other six days of the week, we're complaining how tired we are and how I wish I could just rest. I wish I could just do nothing today, right? And then God actually commands us, yes, <laughs> you need to take this day off. And what do we turn around and we do? We complain about all the things we can't do now. Do you see how that's strange? <laughs> There's a problem there. Uh, Walter Chantry, he, this is a quote from one of his books on the, on the Sabbath. He says, quote, if a Christian takes a bit of time on the Sabbath day for private Bible reading and prayer, if he is faithful in public worship, if time is spent teaching his children his word, time preparing and teaching a Bible lesson, time visiting the sick and poor in Jesus' name, time witnessing to a friend, time fellowshipping with the saints, time singing praises to God, soon the day seems all too short for the spiritually minded. There is so much to do for God in private, in the family, and in the church, close quote. And then, so that's the positive, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then lastly, there's this prohibition in verse 10. He says, in it you shall do no work. And he e e expands on that, not only yourself, but your family, your extended family, things of that nature. Now, as I've already mentioned, the point of the Sabbath, the point of the command here is not inactivity, okay? 
That's never been the point of the, of, of the Sabbath. Um, if that were the case, then the one who takes the most naps and sleeps through you know, morning and evening worship is the one who gets the trophy of best Sabbath keeper, right? That's not the intention behind the command. The point, as I said, is ceasing from a certain kind of work to refocus those energies on spiritual things. Okay? The point is ceasing from our gainful employment so that we can give ourselves wholeheartedly to the works of God. Now, I want to open up under this, this prohibition uh, three types of spiritual work that we ought to give ourselves to on the Lord's Day. Okay, three types of work that we ought to give ourselves to. And the first one is the most obvious, what we call works of piety, right? And w within this category, we are talking about freeing ourselves from our, our work and our employment so that we are free to worship God and gather together as God's people, right? To enjoy God. Uh, John 5, 17, you, you remember Jesus, again, is being confronted by the Pharisees because of what he had done on the Sabbath. And Jesus says to them, my father is working until now, and I too am working. In other words, what the Pharisees had failed uh, to understand is that even when God rested on the seventh day, he didn't become inactive, but he enjoyed what he had made. And we too, as the people of God, are to work on the Lord's day to enjoy God. Now, also related to this are Jesus' words to the Pharisees, uh, again, when they reprimanded him for letting his disciples pick, pick the heads of grain on the Sabbath. Do you remember Jesus in Matthew 12, 5? He, he makes this argument. They're saying this is unlawful. They shouldn't pick grains of head on the Sabbath, uh, or heads of grain. And um, Jesus says, have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and yet are blameless? Right? What Jesus is getting at is this. When, under the Old Covenant, did a priest work harder than on the Sabbath? Never. That's, the, that's his work day, right? That's when he's offering more sacrifices, he's singing more songs, he's teaching more people. Um, and yet, Jesus says, why were they blameless? Because their energies were being poured out in the service of God, which is what the Lord's Day is for. It's what the Sabbath is for. Now, that obviously applies to pastors as well. Sundays is, are often our most busy and tiring of days. But for all of us, we should give ourselves, exert ourselves in works of piety, works of worship, being in attendance, being engaged in fellowship and discussion with one another. The second thing is, a uh, second type of thing we should give ourselves to is what we call works of necessity, okay? Works of necessity. And this is kind of a concession or a qualification. Um, we all recognize we don't cease to be humans on the Lord's Day. And we still have basic needs that need to be attended to, right? Um, that's why Jesus defended that it's okay for his disciples to eat heads of grain on the, on the Sabbath. You should still eat on the Lord's Day, okay? <laughs> In case anyone's been tempted to give up eating. Um, this, again, is Jesus' Jesus's point with the Pharisees. Uh, you remember when Jesus says to the Pharisees, if your sheep or ox falls into a ditch on the Sabbath and is going to die, who of you isn't going to, to work to go and get it out of the ditch, right? Um, so, for instance, we understand emergencies still happen. Certain things still have to be tended to. Uh, if you were to take a walk next to a river on the Lord's Day and one of your, you know, your three-year-old falls into the river, it would be a horrible application of the, of the fourth commandment to say, I'm sorry, it would take work to save my child. <laughs> By all means, jump in, save them, swim hard. Uh, we, we, we need to uh, recognize that these things still happen. These are works of necessity. Um, again, the principle ne that needs to govern us is Jesus' principle that the Sabbath is made for man, not the other way around. Right? And I, I think... You know, in terms of like thinking through that category, I think many professions in the medical community fall into this category. Uh, firefighters, policemen, we still need hospitals running on, on the Lord's Day, and I praise God that they do. Um, accidents and emergencies don't just magically vanish on Sundays, and we should not condemn them who give themselves to preserving innocent life on the Lord's Day. So works of necessity, but also thirdly, works of mercy. Works of mercy. 
And this is what we see exemplified by Jesus himself. Jesus, Acts says, was a man who went about doing good. Jesus did good to all as he had opportunity. He performed healings on the Sabbath. And while the Pharisees condemned him for doing those things, which is, shows quite an amazing hardness of heart, um, while they condemned him, Jesus said it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And I think we as Christians need to remember, again, the Lord's Day is an opportunity for doing good to others. Visiting the sick, visiting orphans and widows are good uses of the Lord's Day. Uh, in fact, Spurgeon at, at the tabernacle, when they grew so big that they couldn't fit everybody in the building, he would actually encourage his members in evening worship, rather than coming to church, make, leave room for unbelievers to come and hear the gospel, and you guys go out into the city and preach the gospel out there. I, I think that's an excellent uh, example of a work of mercy, of, of giving ourselves on the Lord's Day to doing good uh, to others. Now, before we move into our application, our last point this morning, let, let me give an encouragement. Um, I genuinely, as, as a pastor here at Bethany, I think that my, my impression is that our congregation has a pretty good balanced view of the Lord's Day. I think our people take it seriously, they view it reverently, and yet at the same time, we're not a bunch of sin sniffers who are just eager to tear each other apart for every little thing that someone else, you know, we heard someone else did this on the Lord's Day. I, I think we've got a good good balance there. But let me give an encouragement to those who are perhaps tempted to be more rigid in their application of the Lord's Day. Um, and all of us will land in different places on what is and what isn't permissible. Some things are obvious, some things are less obvious. Let, let me just say this. Jesus was far more lenient and charitable in applying issues of necessity and works of piety, works of mercy, than the Pharisees were, right? There are many things that are black and white, and I, and I agree. And I probably have some things that I think are black and white that some of you would think that's crazy. But um, for instance, we all know we don't need clowns on Sundays, right? We'd recognize that's unnecessary. So if that's your job, you're a clown for a living, um, you don't need to work on Sundays. It's not, it's not, it's not a necessity. Um, but there is a large area in which we must be charitable, right? You, you think about what about electricity uh, plants, you know, generating plants that supply power to things like hospitals, <laughs> things like churches, uh, the homes of elderly people and sick. I suspect the Pharisees would have probably had a ready-made answer to that. But the Lord was much more lenient in his approach. And as I've already said, this is the, the issue that distinguished Jesus from the Pharisees. The Pharisees demonstrated in their strict application of these principles that they had little regard for mankind. They thought that man existed to live serving the Sabbath rather than the other way around. And they were willing, even to the point of imposing enormous pain and inconvenience on people, they were determined to make people serve the Sabbath. But never did the Lord intend that we should serve the Sabbath, but rather that the Sabbath should serve us. And so whenever a particular application of the Sabbath becomes so unreasonable that it forces us into just painful contortion and it makes it obvious that we are not caring for our fellow man here, we need to come to the conclusion that we've applied it wrong. Uh, the Sabbath is made for our good. Um, and Jesus returns our minds to the heart of the Sabbath, that it's given for our happiness and our well-being. Uh, it's a day given for spiritual benefit and worship. Uh, and so as far as is possible, we should refrain from our worldly labor. But this, this requirement was never intended to be applied so rigidly that we cease to then love our fellow man. So let's, let's come to our last, our last section here, our application. Okay, our, our application. I want to give us um, two applications here. Um, regarding One, regarding our own lives as we view the Lord's Day, but then the second one, particularly as parents, as we model the Lord's Day for our children. Okay? So two applications, and both of them have some sub-points. Um, number one is this. Number one takeaway, 
make corporate worship and the Lord's Day a priority in your life. Make corporate worship and the Lord's Day a priority in your life. God's design is simple and for our good. Um, in a million ways today, I mean, you, you go to the, a Christian bookstore, you listen to sermons that are preached today. In a million ways, the church is telling Christians to run around kind of like chickens with their heads cut off, looking for a silver bullet magic fix to all of their problems, that if you just read this or do this or read this article or whatever, all of your problems will, will go away. And in our busyness, we've missed God's simple plan to transform his people into a more holy people, namely the Lord's Day, the, the regular weekly ministry of the word and worship, what we call the ordinary means of grace. That, that's how God works in his people. That, that's how God uh, transforms his people, Sunday by Sunday. I really think this is something our generation, particularly maybe the, the younger generation, needs to recognize. We want spiritual transformation to happen in crisis moments, right? Like I, I, I just, I heard one sermon or I sung one hymn, and all of my problems in my whole life were fixed forever, right? Anyone, anyone else wish that that's how it worked? <laughs> and many people are looking for that. They're looking for the, the silver bullet crisis experience. Um, but it doesn't work like that. Uh, sometimes, I've just done this again with my, my document. I keep hitting the left button instead of the down button. Um, let's see. Here we go. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> I'll pick up where I was. Um, did I mention I'm not, I'm not loving preaching from a laptop? Uh, and you're probably not either. Uh, um, sometimes it's true. God does particularly impress a certain sermon or a song upon us. And I don't deny that. I know that I've, I've got a few sermons from my 12 something years of being a Christian that I can think back on that really had an impact on my life. But honestly, if I were to ask you, um, any of you today, not only to name, but to tell me what a certain sermon was about that I preached a year ago, you wouldn't do very well. <laughs> and I wouldn't do very well either, by the way. I, I, I can hardly remember what I preached two weeks ago. Um, but the point is, it's not that this just crisis thing happens to us and all our problems get fixed. But it's this constant giving ourselves to the ordinary means of grace in which God is changing us in a thousand imperceptible ways that we don't even realize. Um, from one degree of glory to the next. Not, not through flash floods, so to speak, but through the, the just constant drip that erodes the riverbed. Um, I've seen this in our congregation. We've had married couples whose marriages are on the rocks, come into our church. They start sitting under the faithful exposition of God's word. And guess what happens? In six months, their marriages are improving. Even though I never preached a sermon on five tips for, for a healthy marriage. Right? I just preached chapter by chapter, book by book, through different books. And all of a sudden, their marriages are doing better. Uh, they're doing family worship. Uh, they're honoring one another. They're honoring the Lord as holy in their hearts. That, that's how the Lord's Day shapes us. Um, I believe, brothers and sisters, it is a moral command binding upon Christians to order our lives in such a way that the Lord's Day doesn't get squeezed out because this is what God has ordained for our growth. And so if that means cutting out other things like kids' activities or school things or whatever it might be, uh, even rearranging our work, if that's getting in the way of, of the Lord's Day, we need to do whatever needs to be done so that we make the Lord's Day a feast day for our souls. Um, Sub-point under this is honor the whole Lord's Day. I, I've already, already alluded to this, but recognize that it is the Lord's Day and it's not just the Lord's morning. Uh, if we treat our duty to God as fulfilled simply by coming for an hour and a half to, to, to corporate worship, and then we go the rest of the Sunday as though it's our day, we've missed the point, right? Um, you remember there were both morning and evening sacrifices in Israel in the Old Covenant. And I think that's one of the good precedents for morning and evening or afternoon worship services on, on the Lord's Day. But here's the point. If you... 
If you leave on a Sunday morning and just treat the rest of the day as your own, you are not really disciplining yourself in giving yourself up wholly to the Lord in public and in private worship. Um, I think many Christians have busied ourselves out of the blessings of the Lord's Day. Uh, We've viewed it as burdensome, and we've preoccupied ourselves with other worldly engagements um, so that we are not only robbing God of His glory, but we're spiritually killing ourselves because we're neglecting the means God has given us. Uh, second, last sub-point under this first application, guard the Lord's Day. Okay, guard the Lord's Day. Um, one author, I thought it was a helpful illustration, he said we should treat our commitment to the Lord's Day like divorce used to be treated before no-fault divorce. Uh, nowadays, anyone can divorce for pretty much any reason, and because of that, people just pursue it too flippantly because it's an option. But um, before the whole idea of no-fault divorce, uh, people knew that divorce simply is not an option if, if there's no legitimate grounds. And by eliminating that option, it forced people to work it out. And that's how we should view our commitment to the Lord's Day. We should guard our commitment on to, uh, to Sundays in the same way that I will be there regardless. Right? It's, it's, not simply, or, or it's not simply something that maybe I'll go if everything else works out all right and I can make it. Uh, but rather, I simply, uh, it's, it's not an option to not be there. Unless, of course, you're, you're very sick. We understand that there are some providential, legitimate providential reasons. Um, and when we settle that in our souls, it helps us to realize that everything else accommodates the Lord's Day rather than the other day around. Right? Our, our Lord's Day, our, our lives should be organized around Sundays. Um, whether it be things like shopping, uh, business, uh, you, you name it, all those types of things, those should be uh, revolving around our commitment to the Lord's Day, not the other way around. Now, second application, and then we'll, we're making our way towards a close here. Second application, I want to give an encouragement to our parents, with young children especially, but children of any age. Parents, How you observe the Lord's Day and commit yourself to the Lord's Day is the way that you demonstrate to your children how much the Lord really matters, right? There's a vital connection between what your children see in you and how you relate to God's day um, in terms of shepherding them to how they will then relate to God. So let let me give parents some practical advice, okay? Number one, commit yourself to every Sunday sitting together as a family at church. Right? It's, it's amazing how these simple things we take for granted. But you think about your child's life. If they were raised in the church, how many Sundays does that mean that they sat in church next to their parents worshiping God? Um, we, we have the cry room. We have the, the foyer for moms and dads who need it. But you know our heart on that. It's not, it's not supposed to be a crutch that we rely upon forever. It's a temporary help as we seek to train and di- you know, discipline our children. But go to church every week with your children, even on vacation. right? Just because we take a break doesn't mean God's commands take a break. Um, 52 weeks a year, sit together. Don't underestimate the power of the ordinary means of grace to your children. Um, Second practical encouragement, model for your children that that, um, Sunday is the Lord's day, not your day. Uh, We used to do this. We don't don't ask our kids this as often as we used to. We probably should start again. But we used to ask our kids on our way to church usually, whose day is it today? Is this our day? And Jerusha and Jude would respond, no, it's the Lord's day, right? That's what we need to be getting into the hearts and minds of our children, that this is a market day for our souls. Not only mom and dad's souls, but our kids' souls. Um, parents, don't let the Lord's Day become cluttered with excessive travel and unnecessary labor. Uh, when you talk about the Lord's Day, when you're getting ready for the Lord's Day on Sunday mornings, um, talk about it with enthusiasm with your children ra- rather than bemoaning it. Like, I guess we've got to go to church. <laughs> That's a terrible example to, to give to our children. Make church the high point of, of the week, uh, not something that you just kind of get through in order to get to whatever you really wanted to do in the afternoon, right? Because believe me, your children see that. 
If they see that mom and dad just kind of go through the motions on Sunday morning, but then they're really excited for the baseball game on Sunday afternoon, they're going to see what, what mom and dad really, really value. Um, in other words, let your children know that you love the Lord's Day. Um, even outside of corporate worship on the Lord's Day, I think there are ways in which we should seek to show our children this day is a celebration. This day is not, uh, is not a straitjacket for dullness, but rather you can do things. Do the things that you don't do on any other day with your children on the Lord's Day to show them that this is a, a day of blessing and celebration. And then the third thing, last thing, Worship together as a family at home. Worship together as a family at home. There will be a great disconnect for your children. Even if you regularly attend Sunday worship, if you then live the whole week and your whole life as though God is not also worthy of worship all the other days of the week. Um, I want to encourage especially dads, if you're not leading your family and children through regular reading of the Bible, regular prayer with your children, you need, by God's grace, to start obeying Deuteronomy 6. Start talking about these things as you walk in the way, when you sit, when you lie down. Um, Men, ask other men how they're doing in regular devotions. Not not in a sin-sniffing way, not with a condemning spirit, but out of a heart that's concerned to want to encourage our brothers uh, to be faithful to their children. Um, As I've said... With so many of these, uh, these commands, how you lead your children is training them for how they will relate to God. And how we view the Lord's Day is a key component of that. So let us, let us close, brothers and sisters. This is God's command to us for His glory, but also for our good. It's given to us for our spiritual growth, also the training of our children. We should not view the Lord's Day as a day of dour restriction but rather a day in which God invites us one day out of seven to put aside all of the other things and to come and focus on the Lord and His goodness to us. So let let us pray together. Father, we pray that You would write Your Word upon our hearts. We pray, Lord, that You would help us as Your people to give You thanks for the blessing of the Lord's Day. Father, we pray that we would conscientiously seek to honor you, that we would give ourselves not only in corporate worship, but also in family worship and uh, the fellowship of the saints after our our services and in all these things that you've given to us, Lord, help us to make the most of the Lord's day. We pray, Father, that you would help us, forgive us for at times viewing it as burdensome, Lord, for at times being frustrated with the things that we're prohibited from doing rather than viewing it as your gracious command for us to rest in you, to rest in Christ for our salvation. Lord, we pray that you draw near to us. We pray that you'd bless the rest of our Lord's Day today. We pray that you'd be with us in our afternoon service. We pray for uh, Pastor Rob as he comes to preach to us. Pray that you would help him. Pray that you would be his help in the pulpit and that you would feed our, our souls. Lord, that we would be fed uh, full today from your word. Lord, we pray that you'd bless our fellowship time now in between our service. We pray that you'd uh, cause our conversations to be those that are pleasing to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.